Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Radio Network. I'm your host, Mike Goodpastor. I want to welcome in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer. Good evening, Mike. I'm happy to be here, always happy to be here. I want to welcome all of our listeners in. Uh, thank you for joining us. And it's been a couple of weeks since we've been on here, so there hadn't been much going on. Plus, I had to have surgery, so I scheduled my surgery during a couple down weeks, so it wouldn't cut into our show. Yeah, very really nice. It, it just sucks that the boxing schedule's been so slow lately. Sorry, people. Yeah, I mean, there were a couple fights over the last couple of weeks. Um, we had Peralta, who won a split decision over Robert Guerrero last night. Um, you think maybe it's about time for Guerrero to hang it up? Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I remember before the Floyd Mayweather fight, you know, there are always some people, especially the bandwagoners, who are like, oh, no, Guerrero, he's, you know, a 2-3 division champion, and he poses a legitimate threat. Oh, he beat up this guy. Uh, I mean, I've been convinced ever since he moved up to 147 that he he wasn't going to be the same kind of threat that he was in the lower weight classes. I mean, he, you know, when he was at 126, he was huge. I mean, he was a tall guy, south tall, high work rate, pretty good pop. Uh, you know, down down in the lower divisions, I thought he was he was pretty damn good. Um, I remember he got outboxed by Orlando Salido, but I think Salido ended up selling a drug test. But you know, his only uh, the only thing that he's done at 147 really is he beat up on Andre Berto. And Berto is, in, you know, for me, he's always been kind of a fringe guy, whether or not he held some some world trinket or not. That You know, that's, that's no concern. But, I mean, yeah, I was never convinced that he was going to be a, a credible threat at 147, and I think he's shown that. I mean, he's squeaked by a number of people since he's been at 147. I mean, he, you know, he didn't look amazing against Kamigai. He, you know, he lost clearly to Thurman. I thought he lost against Aaron Martinez, who a lot of yeah. people thought he he was just fighting to stay busy when I mean, he got out boxed pretty clearly by Danny Garcia, and now you know to Peralta who doesn't look like a world class fighter either. Um, I, he'll probably just hang around and collect paychecks now, um, but he lost, and he's certainly on the way out. He's been on the way out in my opinion. Um, if if I were to recommend that he does something in his career, of course I'm not his advisor. I think he should move down, honestly. I think he could, and I think he'd be more effective, but uh, I just think at this point in time he's taken you know, a few too many beatings, and uh, it's just time for him to, I don't want to say hang it up. Of course, he's still got some fight left in him, but uh, he's just going to have to fight lower-quality guys. Yeah, I think really at his age, for as long as he's been at 147, I don't think he can make it back to 140 as easily as you think. Yeah, well, I mean, that may be the it case. It gets harder I mean, to lose weight when you get older, Jeremiah. That's true, but I mean, for a guy who started at 126, I don't, I, part of me just thinks that he could lose an extra seven pounds. And But either way, I don't see him as an effective force at any weight class that he chooses to be at. He's just gonna no, but he to, was a really good fighter at the lower weights. Yeah, he was. I mean, I, I, I liked watching him beat, you know, guys like Cosmayor and even Katsidis, who I was a big fan of. I mean, uh, you know, Jason Oh, I love Katsidis. When that dude oh. fought, you knew there was going to be a fight. Oh, yeah. Katsidis was a guy I was high on, not because I thought he was any world beater, but he was one of those guys who came really close a few times. I mean, I remember he was beating Joel Cosmayor, and then he runs into a punch and loses. I mean, he was he was one of those guys who was pretty raw. You know, he didn't he wasn't very fluid in his movement. But that man, was the beauty guy, of him, though. There's always a chance. Oh yeah, he could run into a punch, or you could run into one of his punches. Oh yeah, I mean, he dropped uh, Juan Manuel Marquez with a big hook. I remember early in the fight. I think I think maybe it was a third round. Uh, but yeah, Katsidis Katsidis was excellent. I love watching that guy. Plus he cut. Yeah, who was the dude he fought in England? Was it Graham Earl? Yes. Yep. Great fight between those two. I mean, I know it's on YouTube. I watched it a few months ago, but him and Graham Earl in, I think it was in England, was an absolute classic fight. Yeah, he's, he's had a good number of them, too. I mean, he was, uh, remember the the fight with Juan Diaz? I mean, that was only a split decision. Yeah, I mean, has he him. been in a bad fight? Uh, I, Which I is can't one of the reasons why his career was so short, too, I think. But Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, think I, think, I think he used to come into the ring dressed like a Roman gladiator also. Yeah, he used to he used to come in dressed like a like a Spartan warrior because he was, he was yeah, half that's Greek. What it was. Yeah, he was half Greek. He was like part of half Australian, half Greek. Yeah, cool, cool guy. Well, and he ended up going out on the shield at least. Um, 
You know, and it's better to go out being a guy that maybe gets your ass knocked out a few times, but people remember you that way than to go out almost any other way as a boxer. Oh, yeah. Yep, he went, he went out on a shield. He he stuck true to that uh, that Spartan tradition. <laughs> yep. Well, you know about that. you got a lot of Spartan descendants in your family, too, since you're from Colorado. <laughs> um, all right. right, we go to the next big thing in boxing, which is Errol Spence beat Leonard Bundu, who actually is a solid fighter, but he's close to my age, so... He didn't have much of a chance going into this, but I did think it was impressive how easily Spence took care of him. Yeah, Spence, uh, you know, to his credit, he beat uh, he beat up Bundu much more clearly than uh, Keith Thurman did. I mean, Thurman was was content boxing him, you know, whereas Thurman he knew Bundu didn't have power. He treated him like he was Chris Algieri. He just came at him. I mean, he took a few shots. He, he still needs to work on his head movement, but he just came through whatever Bundu had and just broke him down and ended up stopping him. It reminded me of the Chris Algieri fight a bit. But I do think Bundu had some, he did have some some success in spots. You know, he did box well. I mean, some people actually gave Bundu at least a round. Uh, but Spence, a lot of people think he's the real deal. Um, I'm not crowning him a king yet. I mean, a lot of people are already there. Uh, but I think 147, there's a lot of talented guys. And I want to see Spence against one of these one of these one of these top ten fellows before I start, you know, again, placing that crown on his head. But he looks like a real good southpaw, and he looks like a big guy to me. I think eventually he's going to move up. Yeah. Um, big talent. Ally. He's just a talented fighter. I mean, he can knock you out. He can outbox you. And the thing about him is he doesn't do a lot of running. He pretty much stands in the pocket and fights with you. Um, yeah. So you brought up the welterweight division, I think. As of right now, everybody's one-two has to be Kell Brook, Keith Thurman. Um, Brook's going up to fight Golovkin. Do you think, win or lose, when that fight's over, he's going to come back to welterweight, or do you think he's fought his last fight at welterweight? Yeah, well, I know for the Spence bandwagoners, I know they think it's going to give it gives Brook an excuse to stay away from him because now that Spence is the IBF mandatory. Um, but I don't buy that personally. I mean, Brook. It's the word around England for a long time is that Brooks struggled to make 147. He's a he's a big guy. Even if, he calls himself massive. And and if his 30 day weigh-in does not evidence of that, I don't know what is. I mean, he weighed 176 at the 30 day weigh-in. I mean, Golovkin he was uh, like what uh, almost 10 pounds more than Golovkin was. Even his yeah. promoter Eddie Hearn said that Brook is is a bigger guy than people would expect. So I, I'm not sure that I see Brook moving back down to 147, uh, especially if he feels comfortable at 160. I mean, plus he's got some domestic guys to fight at 160. I mean, you know, a fight with Saunders or a fight with Eubank. Uh, those are all, you know, ones that people would clamor about in the U.K. Um, also, he can move down to 154. He might be a little, you know, more comfortable there, might be a little more effective um, so I'm not convinced that he goes back down to 147, but I'm also not convinced that it's an excuse for him to duck Spence. I don't think he's afraid of Spence. I think people are already making him out to be If he's a fighting lovely. Gennady Golovkin, he's not afraid right. of Earl Spence. Right. How, it's, yeah, I mean, but I've seen a lot of people make that argument. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Brooke is still, you know, until he, he verbally gives up the weight division, I still think he's the number one guy. I think Thurman's right behind him. And I think if Manny Pacquiao continues to fight, I actually think he may be, you know, one of the top two guys. I mean, because he did, you know, so long as he engages, you know, as so long as he fights, he's still a top guy. I mean, his yeah, I mean, Timmy for, Bradley is still probably a top five or six guy. The Ring Magazine's got him ranked number five still. So that was Pacquiao's last win. It was a convincing win. Did. I mean, it was so big a decision, they couldn't even take it away from him this time. Um, yeah. I think Pacquiao Thurman would be a really interesting fight. Oh, I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see Pacquiao against any of the top guys. In fact, yeah, I Pacquiao could see Spence. why. Well, I mean, not any of them, because Jesse Vargas is ranked eighth, and I really don't want to see that. Oh, God, no, me neither. Spence. But I would Vargas. like to see, you know, maybe you could have Spence fight Vargas with the winner to fight the winner of Pac Man and Keith Thurman. Yeah. Yeah, I just I want to see them crown a new lineal champion. That's what I'm concerned about. I, I'm worried. I'm not so worried about the trinket titles. I want I want the number one guy 
you know, to fight the number two guy, and I want them to establish a, a lineage. Uh, Pacquiao, yeah. I could see how I could see how people would consider Pacquiao the number one guy still. I mean, his his retirement wasn't official. You know, a lot of people stopped ranking him after that. But when you look at his resume, he could still easily be rated the number one guy. Um, but you know, yeah, we get... more recent resume though. Well, I mean, I mean... Chris Algieri's, I mean, Tim Bradley a couple times. I mean, to me, I would take Keith Thurman over him just because of the win over Sean Porter. Maybe, but I mean, how how much better is is Porter than Bradley? I mean, I suppose you could make the argument potentially that that Bradley is more proven than Porter is. Yeah, but I believe uh, this. I believe at this stage of their career, I think Porter beats him. I think Porter hits harder too, which is a big difference. And they're both yeah, good I, boxers. And I think it would end up being a slugfest. But I think Porter's a little quicker, and I think he's a little stronger. Yeah, I mean, and you may be right. I'm just saying that there is an argument there if somebody wanted to Yeah, make I one. agree. I mean, DeBar- Bradley from three or four years ago I think is better than Porter. I just yeah. don't think Bradley is quite what he was. Right. But, well, hell, let's face have... it, neither am I. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I won't be the same person, you know, five hours from now, really. But, uh, I mean, Are you planning on doing binge drinking again tonight? Oh no no I'm I'm, I'm staying sober. If it's uh, it's Sunday. I'm I'm taking it. Oh, I forgot you live in Colorado. I know what you're doing. All right. Um, <laughs> what about guys yeah. like Amir Khan and Danny Garcia? Yeah, well, you know what? In fact, I'd like to see because Danny Garcia seems to be taking the easy road. He seems to be milking it. I wouldn't mind seeing a Danny Garcia Amir Khan rematch for you know Garcia's WBC title. I think that gives. Both the guy, I think that gives Khan the option to right a wrong and become a top player in the division again. And I think it's a winnable fight for Khan. Uh, but I think it's, I mean, because Khan, in my opinion, was winning until he got caught in the first fight. And I think potentially he could win in a rematch. But I find that an intriguing match. But really the welterweight division is, is deep. I mean, not only do we have these top guys, you know, and a guy like Vargas, who I, I don't really, cons- I think he's more of a top 15 kind of guy, really, when it comes what down to What about a guy like Frankie Gomez? Frankie Gomez is a guy that I like. I mean, I made him a prospect of the month, you know, right before his last fight against Herrera because I thought that, granted, he showed up and granted that all the, the words on him were correct, that he, he actually showed up and he trained hard, he looks like a really good fighter. I mean, he has good hand speed, good movement, looks like he can punch a little, box a little. I think he's going to be a top player very, very soon. I mean, on top of that, you have Jose Benavides Jr. I mean, he's a tall good, young, talented kid. Uh, What's your take on the Ukrainian, that Konstantin Panamarov? Oh, yeah, the Russian? Yeah. Um, 30 and 0. So I've actually seen quite a few of his fights. They put him on a lot of the top rank on their cards, and I think he's a good fighter. He's not very quick. Uh, he's but not very, he's, he doesn't hit very hard either, which would No, he me. doesn't. He, he's a volume guy, so he yeah. overwhelms you with volume, but I've seen him progress. I mean, I'm not. he may crack the top ten, uh, legitimately, in my opinion, he may crack the top ten um, here pretty soon. I'm, uh, he's working with um, Abel Sanchez, so he's fighting out of the the Summit Gym, and I've seen improvement in him. He's 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 jabbing really good. Uh, he's establishing distance a bit more. He's not scrapping as much as he used to, and he's had some good wins since two, 2015. He beat uh, Mikhail Zuski, who I think is a really talented young Canadian guy. He just doesn't throw him enough punches. He overwhelmed him with work rate. He beat Brad Solomon, who is an undefeated American prospect, a pretty good fighter. Uh, he looks like he may be a top ten kind of guy, maybe, um, but I actually think that a Ukrainian, um, there is a Ukrainian who is nearing the top 20, um, who I think can also be a top 10 guy. Um, uh, Shelstuk, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but he was an Olympian. Uh, didn't win the gold, from what I remember, but he's a quality boxer. I mean, they've got, you know, Jeff Horn, who we had on, the Australian, a uh, guy that I'm really high on. I'm not saying he's necessarily going to run the division, because, again, there's a lot of talented guys, but... Uh, let me see if I can get this right. Egidis Kavialauskas, um, have you seen him at all? No. Oh, I, I highly recommend checking him out. I mean, he's uh, he comes out of um, um, Garcia's gym in California. He was an Olympian yeah. in, in Lithu- Lithuania. This kid, he's got some good skills. He reminds me a lot of Provodnikov, uh, but a little like his defense is, is better nuanced. You know, he doesn't it would have as much. Be. 
Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's, this kid has big power. Uh, Garcia said he's the hardest-hitting welterweight he's had. Um, he looked he just looked really good in his last few fights. A lot of people uh, thought he had a flat performance against Dennis Ilsbay, who was uh, a tough German kid. But I thought he looked really good. He he just chose to box instead of brawl. And he, he's he's had some sensational knockouts. The kid looks the goods, in my opinion. But of course, I could be wrong. You know, I, I've yet to see him against a top fighter. But he's he's definitely one to keep an eye on. And I recommend go check out. Uh, um, video footage if he could, but I mean, a lot of people also forget. I mean, Saddam Ali he ended up getting stopped by Vargas, um, yeah. but I think if he I think if he fights a light hitter, you know, somebody like Bradley or or somebody like that, I think he could be a player. Um, Diego Chavez, the guy who <clears throat> ended up getting disqualified against Brandon Rios, but I thought he was clearly winning that fight. Uh, he looks like he can be a player. He's a pretty good uh, boxer puncher type. Um, and there's a lot of veterans around the, the weight divisions, too. I mean, guys like Devon Alexander who can give these young guys, uh, you know, just a good little go. I, I really like the class. I think it's heating up, and I think it's more interesting now that, you know, Mayweather is out of the picture and, and Pacquiao's about to be. Oh, and I can't and the waterweight about... division has always been one of the top divisions in boxing. Yeah, and it's hard not to appreciate, you know, these, these smaller guys because, you know, they're, they're, it's not quite – in my opinion, it's not quite as appealing as the middleweight division where they're a little bit bigger and power seems to be uh, a little more prominent play, a bit more of a factor. Uh, but it's, it's a classic uh, division, and some of the greatest fighters ever have come out of it. And uh, I'm just really excited to see how it plays out. And a guy like uh, Felix Diaz, for instance. I mean, he looks really good in beating another good young guy, Sammy Vasquez. I'm just excited to see how this all plays out. All right, and our final one. I know you brought this up on the show before about the Liam Smith Canelo fight. The Canelo was ducking Triple G. Liam Smith's been saying that. Seems like he's been getting under Canelo's skin a little bit. And then Oscar De La Hoya came out today. I know on the Ring Magazine Twitter feed that they're going to wait until next fall until he is completely ready for Golovkin. What's your take? Yeah, I mean Liam Smith said essentially the same thing that I've been saying on this show that. Canelo moved down to 154 to save face. That's the only reason he did that. When you pay attention to what he was doing on social media... Well, that and the fact that they would have been mandatory and he had to fight him and he wasn't going to. Right, right. All we want to see is the best fight the best. We want the Golovkin-Canelo fight, but Canelo is just... uh, I'm glad Liam Smith called him out because that's that's essentially what uh, Canelo is doing. He moved down to 154 to try and convince people that he was really... You know, he wasn't quite a middleweight yet. And then we, we hear all these rumors that he's negotiating to go to 160 afterwards. Uh, you know, so, again, this, this is what I've been saying. Liam Smith is right in this instance. And Canelo, he just needs to man up and stop being – I don't want to say he's being a bitch, uh, but some of the things he's saying, like, he's like, oh. Well, I think what De La Hoya said, I mean, my problem is this. He could have kept fighting at 160 and said, I'll do it next year when I'm more ready to fight a fighter of that quality. I'm not ready for it right now. Instead, they try to make it look like he's trying to get up to the weight to get ready, and he's obviously not. And they're going to fight Liam Smith, which, I mean, I'm a huge boxing fan. I've heard of Liam Smith before, but I've never seen Liam Smith fight. And to think he's going to be on a pay-per-view card as the main event, the first time I ever see him, I don't remember the last time I saw a guy. The first time I ever saw him was on the pay-per-view main event. No, I mean, I don't remember either, and I don't, I don't know what De La Hoya is doing with his marketing here. I mean, this is the sort of thing that gets people to root for Liam Smith. You know, we don't even know who Liam Smith is. He's a big underdog. He's going to be a big underdog in, the, in terms of betting. I mean, people don't know who he is. So when, when Canelo's sitting here, you know, picking on the, you know, the worst – uh, title holder in the division, and then he's saying, oh, well, I think Mexican athletes, I think Mexico criticizes their athletes too much and stuff like that. He's just, he's just he's turning this all into a breeding ground to root against him. Uh, I mean, I still like the guy, and I, I don't think he's, he's you know a bad guy at heart. I just think he's kind of playing around with, uh, I think he's following what Oscar De La Hoya is is saying, I think Oscar is just trying to move him carefully and, and milk him for all that he's worth. But, yeah, in terms of pay-per-view, I mean, who is Liam Smith? He's not even that popular in um, in the U.K., honestly. 
No, he's not. He's not. He might not even be the most popular brother. I mean, it seems like Callum, his his big brother at 168, may be the yeah. most popular of all the Smiths. I mean, I've I watched him. Like, yeah, Callum's a good fighter, and he may turn out to be the best one of the bunch. But you know, Liam, I watched his last fight. He's he's under Frank Warren's promotional banner. He didn't even draw that that, that big of a crowd. I mean, I'm used to seeing you know Anthony Joshua and Josh Warrington and guys like Ricky Hatton. You know they're bringing down the house, but Liam Smith he doesn't bring that sort of excitement. And well, his name's Liam. Yeah, right. Well, his nickname. It's hard to get excited about a Liam. Well, it's it's harder to get excited about a guy nicknamed Beefy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but. It's, it's it's a slap in the face to uh, to us as fans. There's no reason this should be a pay per view, and I I certainly won't be paying for it. All right, well, I guess we're going to wrap it up. But next Sunday, we will have a more interesting show, I believe, as we got Gennady Golovkin, Kel Brook, and a few other big fights coming up on the weekend after the one coming up here. And so in two weeks, we'll have some big-time fights. We'll be talking about those next week. We may have a couple special guests. Maybe we'll have Kerbit Centron on. I know he's going to be fighting on a spike card on the Friday night before the Brook fight. I know Roman and Chocolatito is going to be on the same weekend, so I mean, we're definitely going to have some stuff to talk about on next week's show, so make sure everybody checks in. Jeremiah, you got any final words? No, no final words. Nothing nothing too exciting to talk about. I'm just hoping that you know some of the rumors that I hear around come true, and then we'll have more to talk about. All right, so let's see. You can check out all our boxing articles, our, our old boxing interviews. We've had guys like Carlos Palomino on, Tim Witherspoon, Marvis Frazier, David Diaz, Kermit Centron, Peter McNeely, which is always an entertaining interview. Um, so make sure you check that out. You going to be writing anything for us anytime soon, Jeremiah? Yeah, you know, i got a little more free time on my hands, so I, I can probably pen up some more articles. So it's just been, I just went through a move. I'm now 60 miles outside Denver. I'm dealing with this, this satellite Internet and whatever the you know, sky gets cloudy. It's just it's been a little rough lately, but yeah, I've, I've certainly got a little more free time, and I'll certainly try to pin up some more stuff so uh, so we can give our fans something to look at. All right, and if you're a football fan, our college football weekly shows and a lot of our NFL weekly shows will start this week. Myself and former Cincinnati Bengal linebacker Joe Kelly will have former Bengal defensive tackle um, Gary Burley, and a little bit of a change on our Bengals Weekly Show. We're going to have Bootsy Collins, who's won multiple Grammy Awards. He's a musician. He'll be on with us. Also check out myself, Dieter Brock, Robert Drummond, Brian Schmidt, Oz Davis, on the CFL Weekly Pick'em Show. And this week also coming up, we will have the NFL, our NFL preseason preview with myself, Matt Andrew Scavage, and, of course, former Steeler Jaguar, Pro Bowl offensive lineman Leon Searcy. Um, Tony Hunter is committed to doing Notre Dame show and a Los Angeles Rams weekly show for us. So make sure you check him out also on those. Um, Leon will also be doing a show about Miami University, or as he calls it so annoyingly, the U. So he will actually be doing the show with Danell Bennett, former fullback for the Kansas City Chiefs. So check out all those shows. Check us out at thegrillingcruth.net. Um... Am I missing anything, Jeremiah? I don't think I am. No. Oh, you can catch our podcast on iHeart, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Music, Spreaker, Stitcher, anywhere you find podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.